Finally, I drove up to my house at 3 o'clock on a Saturday night. On the way back from Aberdeen to London, the traffic was terrible. It always happens on Fridays. And there were a lot of cars on the freeway, which delayed me for several hours. I thought that Vicky, Victoria, my wife, would have been in bed a long time ago, but I was surprised that she didn't leave the light on for me. Taking my bags and briefcase out of the trunk of the car, which I almost managed to carry all at once, I waddled over to the front door. Once inside, I immediately realized that something was very wrong. It was cold in the house. Obviously, the heating was turned off or turned on very weakly. It was unusual because Vicky couldn't stand the cold. After putting my bags on the floor, I turned on the light and was shocked to see that some of our furniture was missing. In some confusion, I quickly went upstairs to our bedroom, where Vicky was supposed to be sleeping in bed. The bed was empty. The closet doors and dresser drawers were open, and almost all of Vicky's clothes were gone. I stood there in shock for a few moments. What's going on here? Thinking that a little something to drink would be a good idea, I returned to our living room. I grabbed a bottle of rum from the bar, then collapsed into my deep armchair to reflect on the situation I found myself in. It was quite obvious that my loving wife had abandoned me. But why? Vicky and I have been married for almost 19 years. We had two wonderful 18-year-old twin girls, both in their first year at Bristol University. Uh, don't try to do a little math. Vicky wasn't even five months old when we got married. Look, I'll be honest. When Vicky and I got married, I don't think we were head over heels in love with each other. We were just dating and having a good time. But you know how it is. We screwed up big time. Vicky got pregnant with Susan and Sandra, and I did the gentlemanly thing. There was nothing more I could do. My old man would have killed me if I hadn't done it. But love is a strange thing. I soon found myself completely in love with Vicky and my girls. Almost my whole life revolved around them. Whatever Vicky wanted, I'd break my back to get it. I don't care what anyone says. I am devoted to her as any man can be devoted to his wife. And since the girls left for university, we've been making up for lost time when they were kids. However, it wasn't quite like that. Victoria was a strong-willed woman, and to be honest, I usually gave in to her desires. Overall, I was happy with most things in my marriage. But now it looked like I was living a lie, or at least Vicky was living a lie. It definitely looked like Vicky had dumped me. I just couldn't figure out why. She always told me how much she loved me. We discussed the fact that neither of us really thought we would have married each other if she hadn't gotten pregnant. But we both agreed that it was probably the best thing that had ever happened to us. And how deeply we had fallen in love with each other since we got married. It seemed to me, that seemed to me, that seemed to me, that someone might have changed their mind. My emotions got the better of me. I suddenly got angry and jumped up to pace the room. Then I ran out into the back garden to light my pipe. Vicky doesn't like the smell of my pipe tobacco in the house so I always go outside to smoke. I stayed there for 10 minutes before I realized that Vicky wasn't here and there was no one to scold me, and it looked like she wouldn't be here in the future either. And yet, for some reason, I finished my pipe outside. As I was returning through the back door, I noticed a letter lying on the kitchen table. I stared at him for a moment. David was written on the envelope. The letter was undoubtedly from Vicky, and when she wrote it, she was annoyed with me. When she calls me David, it means she's upset with me. I sat down at the table, took the envelope and turned it over in my hands. I don't think I really wanted to open it. I knew I wouldn't like what was written inside. I slowly tore open the envelope, then unfolded the letter that was inside. You're terrible. You're a lying, cheating, self-centered husband. I'm leaving you. I thought you loved me, but now I know something else. You cheated on me behind my back with this girl, and I can prove it. I'm going to see a lawyer on Monday. I'm going to divorce you and take everything I can get. I'll teach you how to fool around. 
Didn't you even think a little bit about our girls when you were hanging out with that little girl? She can't be much older than the twins. I'll charge you everything I can. So you better look for another place to live since you won't be able to run the house when I'm done with you. And if I ever see this little girl, you can tell her she's not feeling well. Victoria. Interesting, I said aloud to myself. I wonder who Vicky thinks I'm sleeping with, and who is this little girl? I think there was a mistake somewhere along the way in the intelligence department. Look, do I look like a guy who cheats on his wife? A guy like that would probably have left Vicky when she got pregnant. I'm the kind of guy who appreciates what they have and definitely doesn't want to lose what they have. Yes, there were times when I was tempted. Which guy didn't do it? But I always knew which side of the toast was buttered, and I was always very careful what I did. However, it was obvious that Vicky was convinced that I was fooling around. So what should I do? Well, there was really only one thing to do. Go to bed. Look, I got up before 6 on Friday morning, and now it was 4.30 on Saturday morning. So I went to bed. Yes, it's just so calm. Look, I've achieved what I've achieved in business without letting my emotions get the better of me. Once I realized what the problem was, I could relax a little, knowing that I could quickly calm Vicky's mind. All I had to do was prove to her that she had done everything wrong, and the bingo crisis was over. But when I got into bed, I found that I couldn't sleep. Maybe it's because she expected me to cheat. But why would she do that? One thing I've learned over the years is that people expect others to behave the same way they do. Now wait a minute. Could Vicky have thought that I was cheating on her because she was playing with me, and then, suspecting me for some reason, she assumed that I was cheating on her? At that thought, I jumped out of bed like I'd been shot. It was serious. Before I knew it, I was tearing this house apart in search of something that could give at least some hint that Vicky was cheating on me. I turned her sewing room upside down. There wasn't much point in searching her bedroom drawers. They were all empty. Then I turned on the computer. It took me several hours to search him. I cracked her passwords for her email pretty quickly and then spent hours browsing through internet history files. A big waste of damn time, but necessary. I found absolutely nothing except Vicky's hunt for a divorce lawyer. She did it on Thursday, but I couldn't find any indication that she actually contacted the lawyer she apparently chose. I had an evil idea. The only way to win the battle is to go on the offensive. It was an unlikely chance, but I decided to try anyway. Just after 9 a.m., I sent an email to the lawyer she had obviously chosen, asking her to act on my behalf in the divorce case. There was a slim chance that Vicky hadn't actually spoken to her yet. I was lucky. A few minutes after I sent the email, she replied, asking me to come to the office as soon as possible, which I did. Just after 10 a.m., on Saturday morning, I handed Maria Grant a check, and from that moment on, she became my lawyer. Vicky couldn't understand that some lawyers work on Saturdays. After I told Maria about what I had found at home and showed her the letter, she asked me if I had had ever cheated on my marriage. I told her that I love my wife, and since we got married, I have not done anything that, in my opinion, would put my marriage in jeopardy. Maria told me to be quiet. I have to try to find out where Vicky has gone and talked to her. Maria thought that it was probably just a misunderstanding and that everything could be sorted out if we could have a little chat. I returned home and started hunting for Vicky. I called her parents and brother, but they said they hadn't heard from her, and she wasn't with them. Obviously, she didn't tell them anything. The same was true of her sister, but I decided that she lived too far away for Vicky to go there. Vicky's family, although she obviously kept them in the dark about leaving me, immediately sided with me as soon as I told them why she left. I wasn't looking forward to the next call I made, but I knew it was really my last chance. It was Vicky's friend, Chantel. Chantel got divorced twice. And to be honest, I don't blame the guys. Chantel can be cute as a kitten one minute, but the next, she can turn into a very harmful, hysterical woman. Vicky and Chantel have been friends since high school. 
Whenever Chantel wasn't with one of her many fans, she was usually with Vicky. Vicky and Chantel had a bachelorette party every couple of weeks or so, and it wasn't unusual for Vicky to call me and ask me to pick her up. Vicky and I used to laugh about it a lot. You see, I always thought I could trust Vicky. As soon as Chantel found a boyfriend, Vicky would call me in as backup. I dialed Chantel's number and immediately realized that I had hit the nail on the head. Chantel started yelling at me as soon as she heard my voice. I quietly demanded to talk to Victoria, but Chantel denied that she was there. I was sure that was the case, since it was the only place left for her to go. And Chantel's rant told me that she knew everything about Vicky leaving me. After about five minutes, I gave up and hung up. Negative emotions came flooding back to me, and I went outside again to fill another pipe. While I was there, I pulled myself together and started thinking again. Vicky was playing games. Vicky was playing games. This escape, without talking to me, was designed to piss me off. Well, that shouldn't have turned me on anymore. I haven't done anything that I should be ashamed of. Okay, Vicky, if you wanted to play games, I'll play games. I stormed back into the house and called the twins. They were completely stunned when I told them that their mother had abandoned me. Of course, I told them that I hadn't done anything to make Vicky leave me, and I'm pretty sure I convinced them. I also told them that I thought Vicky was staying at Chantel's, and then said that as far as I understood, she could stay there. The girls said they thought it was all just a stupid misunderstanding and that their mother would come to her senses soon. I know I really shouldn't have involved the girls in this, but we were playing silly games, and I knew they'd give their mother a good beating for it. Then I went to the garage. When we bought the house, I changed the maggots in the locks of the exterior doors, actually for two reasons. Firstly, we didn't know if we had been given all the keys to the house. And secondly, we had a suitable set of larvae. All the exterior doors had the same key. This eliminates the need to carry a lot of keys with you. It takes only a few minutes to install the larva with a Euro lock. Now I replaced all the maggots with the originals, then turned off the garage door opener and bolted the bolt. Vicky wanted to leave. Well, now she was free and couldn't go back. While I was tinkering with the shutters in the garage, old man Blake, my neighbor from the other side of the road, came up to me. He and his missus are a curious couple. So I'm guessing he saw Vicky moving and came over to see what gossip he could gather. He didn't get much out of me, but I found out that Ryder's rented truck showed up on Friday morning, and two guys and a woman helped Vicky take a lot of things out of the house. The two guys drove off in a truck, and Vicky followed them in her Syab. The other woman drove off in a pink Volkswagen Beetle. I was right. It was Chantel. That nasty little pink bug belonged to her. That night, I pulled all the curtains down in the house and closed the blinds on the garage windows. No one could see inside from the outside, but I could see the front door through the video surveillance system. I installed it a few years ago so that Vicky could see who was standing at the door when I wasn't at home. Then I called Chantel again. I told you, David. Victoria is not here. I do not know where she is, and even if I did, I still would not tell you, you crooked husband. It's all right, Chantel. I understand. I just want you to give Vicky a message from me. That is, if you happen to see her, tell her that since she decided to believe some stupid rumors without even talking to me, I don't think I want to know where she went. Actually, I don't think I want to see her again. If you happen to hear anything from her, could you ask her to tell me where my lawyer should send the divorce papers? I'm going to divorce her for desertion. We'll just see who gets the short end of the stick in her little game. You can't do that. She going to divorce you for adultery. In order for her to do that, Chantel, I would actually have to commit adultery with someone. And since I know what I did or didn't do, I think I'm completely safe on that score. Now, don't worry your little head. The divorce will be decided in my favor. Because Vicky took it into her head to leave me. I have a stupid letter here from her in which she says she's doing exactly that. My lawyer says, that's all I'll need. But, I, you, you were seen. 
I hung up the phone and then unplugged the phone. That little slip of the tongue from Chantel was all I needed to hear. She said I and then changed her mind and said you've been seen starting with the last half of the sentence. I figured it was Chantel who thought she'd seen me somewhere with another woman. So, will Chantel tell Vicky exactly what I said? And won't Vicky doubt it? I went to the kitchen and made myself a meal. Then, when it was completely dark outside, I slipped out the back door and went around the house to make sure no one could look inside. Vicky wanted to play games, so there will be games that we will play. Then, I settled down at the computer to entertain myself until the fun I was hoping for really started. It was 8.30 when I saw Vicky Sayab pull up to the driveway. Vicky must have changed her plans. I saw her sitting in the car for a while, watching the house. Then Chantel came over and got into her car. Chantel must have arrived in her car and parked it on the street where I couldn't see her. It looks like Vicky was hedging her bets. I hoped she was thinking that maybe she didn't have enough evidence if the case went to trial, or that maybe she was mistaken. Anyway, I think she hoped she would come back to stay. If she lived in this house, I wouldn't be able to claim that she left me. After waiting about 15 minutes, Vicky got out of the car and tried to unlock the front door. I realized that she probably tried to open the garage door with the remote control, but eventually gave up. Of course, her key didn't fit the lock. Vicky rang the doorbell a couple of times and even called out to me through the mailbox. Chantel got out of the Syab and joined her. I could hear them talking, but other than Chantel saying, try the other door, I couldn't hear anything else. They both went out of range of the video surveillance system, and soon I heard them at the kitchen door, then at the patio door less than five feet away from me. The next minute, they were back at the front door. After trying to open the front door again, Vicky went over and tried to lift the garage shutters manually. Dismissing this as an unfortunate thought, the two of them returned to the Saab and stood next to it for a while, talking animatedly. It ended when Chantel left and Vicky returned to her car. For the next half hour, Vicky sat there, apparently making repeated calls on her cell phone. But I didn't really talk to anyone. I could only assume that she was making calls to her home phone, but the line was disconnected. Then Chantel returned with a bag from McDonald's. She joined Vicky at the Saab, and they stayed there well into the night when they left quite unexpectedly. When I poked my head out from behind the curtain, I saw that they had left Chantel's Volkswagen parked on the street, so I assumed they were planning to return the next morning. They spent the whole Sunday afternoon sitting there in the driveway with Chantel, who made numerous trips to McDonald's, which is not too far away. They left again, just after midnight, but this time, they also took Chantel's car. I assumed that Chantel needed her to go to work the next morning. On Monday, I got up and left the house very early, just in case Vicky showed up again. I went out to the motorway service area, where I ordered a dubious breakfast. Then I sat and read the daily newspapers until it was time for me to go to work. Unusually for me, I was the first one that morning. I thought the game would end today. Vicky was supposed to call my office, but I figured I got some payback for her scaring me on Friday night. And indeed, at five minutes past nine, my phone rang. David, where have you been? Vicky was beside herself. This verbal attack upset me again. To be honest, I expected to see a very contrite Victoria that morning. I wouldn't advise you to try to break into the house again, Vicky. You don't live there anymore, remember? And since the house is too big for me alone, I rented it out. A lie, of course, but it had the desired effect. Vicky's gone crazy. Are you crazy? You couldn't rent it out. Why did you do that? Look, Vicky, we're going to have a very expensive trial, and the rent on the house will help me pay for it. Are you crazy? No. Vicky, you went crazy when you started all this. You accused me of cheating on you. You called me all the nasty names in that stupid letter, and you didn't want to talk to me while you were hiding in Chantel's house. David, we need to talk. It's a little late to talk now, Vicky. The time of the conversation was on Friday evening. Now it's time for lawyers to make money. So that's it. You don't even regret what you did.
Wow. Hold on, girl. First of all, I have nothing to regret. You were the one who left a little bit. You were the one who left the stupid note that almost gave me a heart attack. And it was you who started talking about the divorce. And now I suggest you go and see that lawyer you threatened me with so quickly and find out what he wants to say. Then call me back and give me his details so that I can give them to my lawyer. Goodbye, Victoria. I hung up the phone. Have I gone too far? Well, yes, it probably was. But as far as I understand, there's only one thing worse than finding out that your spouse is playing behind your back, and that's when the person you love doesn't trust you the way they should. I made a couple of phone calls that I thought were necessary. The first one was to Ryder Truck Rental. I needed to check something with them. They gave me a phone number, and I had a long conversation with a very repentant little man. I met him once at one of Chantel's parties. I think I scared the hell out of him. Then I made an international call and highlighted the issue. Half an hour later, Maria Grant called me. She was a little annoyed with me. Mr. Paulson, your wife has just visited us, and I strongly suspect that you knew that she intended to hire me today to act on her behalf. Well, yes. I really suspected that this was exactly what she was going to do. But since you're the best divorce lawyer here, I thought it would be much better if you represented me. My clerk sent her to another lawyer. I warn you that it is very good and expensive. Maria, I don't want to offend you, but could you tell me if there are lawyers who are not expensive? No offense, David. It's your money, and you can say whatever you like. But why don't you talk to her and sort out all this mess? The answer to this question lies in the name. Victoria calls me David. It means she's mad at me. She won't hear what I say when I tell her that I didn't have an affair. She doesn't want to believe me. If she had, she would have called me Dave. Everything is very simple. Victoria never called me David. Um, I'm not sure I understand your logic, but I really think you two should get together and talk. Well, I'm ready to do it when Victoria agrees to listen. But then I need to ask her some pretty important questions. If I don't get the answers I need, you will definitely be dealing with our divorce. David, do you have any reason to believe that your wife cheated on you or something like that? Not really, but she seemed to believe pretty quickly that I was cheating. I've always thought that people expect others to behave the same way as themselves. I was just wondering if Victoria was as loyal to me as she expects me to be. She seemed to judge me very quickly. I think I understand your logic now, but this is not something I've encountered before. Well, let's see what happens next, shall we? I'll call you later, Maria. I hardly worked until the end of the morning, and it wasn't until about 12 that Vicky called me back. Dave, we need to talk. I immediately stopped the offensive and agreed to meet her at 2 o'clock in a pub, on the way from my office. At first, Vicky seemed surprised at what she took to be my sudden surrender. But when she started calling me David again, I realized that the fight wasn't over yet. I was sitting in a quiet corner when Vicky entered the bar. She came and sat down opposite me, although I thought she would sit next to me. Aren't you going to buy me a drink? What is it? she asked. No. You can buy these drinks for yourself. Remember, you left me. You don't need me. Vicky was stunned. I think she still thought that I had cheated on her, and therefore had to defend myself. She got up and went to the bar to buy herself something to drink. Well, what can you say in your defense? What is it? She asked when she returned. Victoria, I have no idea what's gotten into you. What do you think I should apologize for? I do not know. You were in Blackpool last weekend with some little girl. You've been seen, so don't try to deny it. Victoria, I was in Edinburgh last week. You know that. I've talked to you about it several times. I don't remember anything like that. I talked to you on your cell phone, and as far as I know, you could have been in Timbuktu. And I was told that you were in Blackpool with a woman. Victoria, I was working. You know my route. It's the same four times a year. 
Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen. Three days in each city. I've been doing the same thing for almost five years now. But you were seen in Blackpool. Okay, Victoria. Who saw me in Blackpool? Whoever told you they saw me there is either wrong or lying. Anyway, why would anyone go to Blackpool at this time of year? It must be terribly cold on this coast at this time of year. To see the fireworks. Last weekend, Chantel went on a bus trip to see the illumination of Blackpool and do some shopping for Christmas. She saw you and the other girl you lived with. She said that you were so absorbed in her that you walked past her a couple of times and she followed you to your room. Chantel, that's what I thought. Vicky, how long have I known Chantel? Since you've known me, I suppose. And you think I wouldn't have noticed Chantel if I'd stayed at the same hotel as her? Oh yeah. How long did I have to share a hotel with her? On the weekend. She went on a weekend trip. From Friday to Monday. Where is your logic, Victoria? Chantel is not my favorite person, but she's beautiful. Do you really think that I, as a man, wouldn't notice those short skirts that she wears? Victoria looked slightly embarrassed. I think the argument was almost over, and she was about to capitulate and start apologizing when the door opened and Chantel walked into the bar. She went straight to our booth, and then, to my surprise, plopped down on the seat next to me, trapping me, with an expression of triumph on her face. She took out a small folder of the type in which photographs are placed. Now, explain it. She demanded, pulling the photos out of the folder and thrusting them under my nose. I took a quick look at the photos and then started smiling. I took them from Chantel's hands and turned them towards Victoria. Oh, didn't you recognize me? Ling, Victoria? Listen, Victoria. Chantel took some nice pictures of me, Ling. I hope you remember my brother, Chantel. You know, Chantel. I really didn't know they were there. Did you, Vicky? I believe their ship must have docked in Liverpool, and Philip must have taken me, Ling, too, to see the illumination of Blackpool. You know that their ship usually docks in Amsterdam. My twin brother is married to me, Ling, a beautiful little Chinese woman whom he met in Singapore a few years ago. They live on a container ship, where he holds the position of first assistant. The ship spends so little time in port that many married crew members accompany their spouses. Oh. And by the way, my brother and I are identical twins, just like my daughters. Twins in my family. That's the rule. Vicky started crying, and Chantel sat with her mouth open. So I continued. Did you say hello to Phil, Chantel? If I remember correctly, you were crazy about him at our wedding. But that was a long time ago, wasn't it? Now, they were both crying. Vicky because she screwed up so badly, and Chantel, I guess because she was upset that she had dragged Vicky into this. I sat and sipped my beer while the two of them came to their senses. After a while, they stopped crying, but it was obvious that they had no idea what to say. Chantel was the first to pluck up her courage. Dave, I'm sorry I completely forgot about Phil. I really thought it was you. You look so much alike, Chantel finally said. Well, we are exactly alike, after all, we are identical twins. And I wouldn't worry about Phil not recognizing you, Chantel. I doubt he'd remember a girl like you. It was a little inappropriate, but I was still very angry. <sighs> I'm so sorry, Dave. Now Vicky seemed to have regained her courage. I just didn't think about Felipe. Can you forgive me for being so stupid? You have to understand how it looked to me. No, I can't, I said angrily. Both girls suddenly had very shocked expressions on their faces. I have a question for you, Vicky. Why? What makes you think I'm going to cheat on you at all? We've been married for 19 years. During this time, have I ever given you a reason to doubt me? No, Dave. You've been a wonderful husband and a great father to our girls. Then why were you so sure I was cheating on you? 
And before you answer that, think about it. Don't tell me it was because Chantel told you. That would mean you trusted her more than you trusted me. I was your husband, the guy who dressed you and fed you for the last 19 years. The guy who came running to find you when you're a so-called girlfriend here found himself a stud for the evening during your night out together, which, by the way, I never objected to. Vicky sat and looked at me. Obviously, she took my warning and thought about it before she spoke. I waited a bit before continuing again. Why were you in such a hurry to believe that I would cheat on you? Is it because you've done things in the past that you shouldn't have done behind my back? You know that people tend to assume that others will behave the same way as themselves. You see, this idea has never occurred to me in the past. I may be dumb or something, but it never occurred to me that you would cheat on me when you were dating your girlfriend, because I could never imagine cheating on you. So I always believed that you wouldn't cheat on me either. But you moved the goalposts, Vicky, and now all that has changed. I think I was very naive. Without hesitation, you assumed that I was cheating on you. You didn't even bother to challenge me or anything like that. Your friend told you that I was cheating, and you accepted it as a fact. No question. Okay, now convince me that you've never cheated on me. All those times when you came home at 2 or 3 in the morning, and about the times when you stayed over at Chantel's. For that matter, what have you been doing while I've been away? Oh my God, Dave, I've never cheated on you. Honestly, Victoria finally exclaimed. Oh, that's what you say. But if that's the case, then who were the two jerks who drove that rider truck on Friday? And why did you kiss one of them? I saw Vicky literally jump when I said she kissed a guy. These are a couple of guys from Chantel's office. She asked them to help me. Oh, yeah. And how did you pay them for their help when they delivered your stuff to Chantel's house? The same way Chantel pays for her services? Vicky knew what I was talking about. Chantel often told us how she pays for the maintenance of her car. I warned her many times that the garage owner's wife is a tough woman. I saw her in action once. Entertaining, but a little humiliating. Come on, most guys like a good catfight. I never saw the girl she found her husband with again. No, no, no. I wouldn't do that. I just kissed Mike lightly on the cheek to thank him for his help. That's all. It was just a light kiss. Yes, but it was in public, where the whole world could see you. What did he get in private at Chantel's house? Nothing, Dave. You have to believe me. They just unloaded the van and drove away. They had to bring the van back. If that's the case, can you explain why you were charged an additional fee then? This van was not returned until 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. When you order a van online, girl, they send the documents back by email. I read this letter. The van was not returned until 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. So what really happened? Now, I need to get out of here before I lose my temper. Let me out of here, Chantel, before I push you out of my way. Chantel stood up, and I pushed past her. I turned back to Victoria. I'm not going to accept anything from you, except the whole truth. I have a lot of friends who go to the same clubs that you and this girl went to. You better decide very quickly if you want to try to save our marriage. At the moment, I don't care anyway. But if anyone tells any stories about what you've been doing in the last few years, you better make sure you tell me about it first. Be at my house tonight at 8 o'clock. I'll give you an hour to explain everything you need. Then I left the bar. Look, I'm not crazy, and I don't think Victoria is really like that. Although I never asked them to, my friends always kept a very close eye on Vicky and Chantel when they spent their nights out. Well, they looked after Chantel. Well, it is well known that she likes to spend time with guys. But I was told that Victoria got a nickname in the clubs. She was known as the Ice Maiden. Vicky was known for being great at laughing on the dance floor. But that was all she ever did. Now Vicky's problem was that she didn't know who all my friends were or how much they had seen. If she had behaved badly, she would have had to tell me about it herself tonight. After having lunch late at night, 
I decided that there was not much point in going back to the office. So I returned home. Once at home, I turned on my phone again, and when I entered the house, I was greeted with a blinking answering machine light. At the beginning of the day, there were several messages that Vicky apparently left before calling me at work. She wanted to know where I was and why she couldn't enter the house. Then there was a call from Ricky Morris. Ricky and I went to school together. We weren't exactly friends then, but let's just say that secretly, it was with my help that he got such good grades for his homework. Ricky liked to play the tough guy when he was with his buddies. But in fact, he wanted to do well in school, and I kind of acted as a private tutor for him. Dave, I've been trying to call you all weekend. What's the matter, buddy? Victoria and Chantel were at the club on Friday night. Chantel told everyone that you two broke up. Call me, okay? I need to know how you react to this. I called Rick back, but before I could say anything, he announced he was coming and hung up. Ten minutes later, his car pulled into my driveway. As I said, Ricky is a tough man who had a lot of trouble with the police in his youth. He coped with himself pretty well as soon as he entered a good gym, where he took up amateur boxing. This somehow led to him becoming a bouncer at one of the major local nightclubs, and eventually he became the manager of that establishment. Some say he also co-owns a couple of local nightclubs. Anyway, as I said, Ricky has a soft spot for me. He's always looked out for my best interests as far as Vicky was concerned. He often called me at work, or sometimes dropped by the pub where I was having lunch. And, without my permission, subtly told me who Vicky was dancing with, and who, if anyone, was trying to get along with her. I'm pretty sure if some guy had ever convinced her to go outside, Ricky or his bouncers would have said something about it. It was Ricky who told me that Victoria had the nickname Ice Maiden. Rick declined my offer of beer as he was working later, so we settled for coffee. Okay, Dave, what's going on with you and Vicky? She was at the club on Friday, and Chantel was telling everyone that you broke up. She said you spent the night with some young girl in Blackpool last weekend or something. Don't tell me. Chantel went to Blackpool last week, and apparently Philippe was there with his miss. Chantel thought it was me, and she told Victoria. I returned from Aberdeen and found that Vicky had left me. Oh, but you fixed it soon, didn't you? Well, not really, Rick. Let's just say that we're playing mind games at the moment. I was very angry that Vicky didn't talk to me about it first. I was wondering if she was playing behind my back. Hey, you don't stand a chance, man. No one gets in Vicky's pants. I'm 100 sure of it. When some of the guys heard that there was a problem between the two of you, they thought they might get lucky on Friday night. But from what I heard, the ice was colder than usual. Vicky and Chantel left long, before closing time. Oh, and the taxi took the two of them straight home to Chantel. I talked to the driver. I thought you might want to know. Thanks, Ricky. It's good to have friends. It's all part of the service, Dave. Hey, it's high time you showed up at the club anyway. You never come to see your friends. Since then, the conversation has returned to what old friends were doing, and the like. Before we knew it, it was almost 8 o'clock, and Ricky said he'd better go to the club. Ricky was just about to leave when Victoria turned into the driveway. I saw Victoria see Ricky when he backed out. She had a confused expression on her face as she clearly recognized him, but she had no idea that I knew him. I was standing in the doorway when she came up the steps. Was that Morris, the manager at Starlight? What is it? she asked. You mean Ricky Morris? Yes, he's an old friend of mine. He came to sympathize with me about our upcoming divorce. Come in and sit in the kitchen. I have coffee making. I followed Vicky into the kitchen and managed to beat her to the coffee pot. Now it was my house, and I would have a coffee. Look, Dave, this is stupid. I know you're mad at me, but you're being childish. Chantel was sure it was you she saw. How was she supposed to know that Philip and me, Ling, were there? What would you think in my situation? Hmm. I would have thought that Chantel made a mistake until I checked everything myself. But you didn't check, did you? 
you decided to leave me. Look, Dave, I was wrong. I admit it. But why did you kick me out of the house? Because you decided it wasn't your home anymore and left it. When you walked out that door on Friday, you effectively ended our marriage. Don't be silly, Dave. I was angry, and I tried to teach you a lesson. I know it was stupid of me. Look, I'm really sorry, and I want to go home. Well, you made the bed, now you better get used to lying on it. You mean you won't let me move back in? Mmm, no. But why not? Because I don't believe you. Or at least I don't trust you. Tell me, when did Chantel tell you that she saw Philip in Blackpool? On Tuesday, when she returned. Before I talked to you on the phone that night or after? After. So on Wednesday, when I called you, you knew that Chantel thought she saw me, or rather Philippe. Mm, yes. So why didn't you challenge me on Wednesday night? Moreover, why didn't you call me back on Tuesday after Chantel told you? Why did you act like nothing had happened? I don't know. At the time, I wasn't sure what I was going to do about it. But you've made up your mind, haven't you? You decided that life would be better without me. You thought you'd get everything, didn't you? All our savings, as well as a decent portion of my pension. I didn't matter. All you cared about was the money. Oh, my God, no, Dave. Where did you get this idea from? I just wanted to scare you. Honestly. So if you were just scaring me, why take all this furniture? It's just that your absence here would be frightening. You didn't have to empty half of this house. You're right. It was overkill. But Chantel said it would make you think I was serious. Oh, Chantel again. It always comes back to Chantel. Did you know that almost all the disagreements we've had over the years have come down to Chantel and the ideas she put in your head? And there is another point. If Chantel told you that she saw me with a Chinese woman, what would you think? I would have thought of Phil right away. But Chantel never told you that the girl she said she saw me with was Oriental, did she? I guess she didn't notice. You have to admit that Mi Ling's traits are not that strong. So why did Chantel tell all the guys at the club that I had something with a little Chinese bird? She couldn't have known. She said she didn't know the girl was Chinese until you pointed out those photos in the pub, and she only got them this morning from the lab. Don't ask me. Ask Ricky the next time you see him or any of your fans at the club. They'll tell you what Chantel told everyone. I think Chantel realized it was May, Ling and Philip when she saw them. I just can't understand why she told you she didn't recognize them. But why would she do that? I do not know, Victoria. She's your friend. You will tell me what she was trying to achieve and why. But she seemed so confident. It was her idea for me to move out of the house. Vicky sat in silence for a long time, staring into space. I got up and poured myself a drink. Can I do the same? What is it? She asked. I poured her a whiskey and soda. Dave, can I ask you something? Is there something you don't like? But will you be honest with me? I've always been honest with you. Well, there were a couple of times when I had to lie to you when I was planning surprises. Like our 10th anniversary honeymoon. No. It's serious. I need you to tell me the truth. And now who's trying to be funny? Of course, I didn't do that. Do I look stupid? God only knows what you can pick up from her. She was never picky. What about Fran Cooper, your former secretary? Fran, are you crazy? You know her husband. So you've never molested Chantel, and you've never had anything to do with Fran. Don't be silly. Why are you asking? You've definitely never kissed Fran? Well, of course. I kissed her several times. If I remember, her old man hunted your almonds under the mistletoe a few times at those Christmas parties. No. I mean, except for the Christmas parties. Everyone is kissing under the mistletoe. 
You're being stupid again. Only a fool would mix business with pleasure. And besides, I was very happy with the woman I had. I, I was such a fool. I won't comment on it, but it cost you more than you'll ever know. Vicky looked at me with a look that should have made me rush to her to calm her down. My heart was drawn to her, but I was still trying to maintain a high moral position. I was still playing the role of the deceived husband. Then she turned on the tears. I've lost the battle. I had enough serious problems getting out of the pub at the beginning of the day when she started crying. Then, Vicky made a serious tactical mistake. If she had sat next to me, I would have capitulated then. I went over and sat next to her, putting my arm around her shoulders. It seemed like an eternity before she stopped crying. You've never done anything you'd be ashamed of in our marriage, have you? Of course, baby. Then, why? Why what, Vicky? Why did Chantel tell me you did it? Why did she tell me that she saw you with Fran? You'd better ask her about it, Victoria. She's your friend. No. She's not a friend. Not anymore. I do not know why. But all the doubts that I had about you in our married life were inspired by Chantel. What kind of doubts? Oh, a suspicion that you cheat when you're not at home and that you had something with Fran. Why have you never said anything about this in the past? Because I love you. I didn't want to bring our relationship to a breakup. I thought that I would leave everything as it is, and you would come back to me. I would never leave you, Vicky. I love you too much. I know that now. I should have always known that. I'm sorry, Dave. I haven't been a very good wife. I didn't trust you enough. Can you forgive me? Oh, now I have a question, but I don't think I should answer. I think you need to answer this question yourself. Look into your heart and understand why you thought I would cheat on you. When you can figure it out, I think you'll get your answer. Vicky reached into her bag and took out her cell phone. She deliberately turned on the speakerphone. Chantel, you're not my friend anymore. I never want to see or hear from you again. Shut up and listen. I'm calling you because if I met you in person, I'm not sure I would be able to control myself. I might do something stupid or something like that. I've been listening to you all my life. And I've been listening to you all my life. I understand that you've always tried to drive a wedge between me and my husband. You've lied to me so many times that I can't count them. No. From now on, stay out of my life. Vicky looked up at me. Can I get my bags out of the car now? No. We'll go straight to bed. I've missed you the last couple of weeks, and you definitely won't need any nightwear tonight. We went up to the bedroom and spent the night trying to relive our honeymoon. I think it was one of the best nights we've ever had. In the morning, I ordered our furniture to be taken from the warehouse that Victoria had hired. We went back to our old life. Oh, I had to pay the lawyer's bills. But at least Chantel disappeared from our lives. I think it was worth every penny. It took a while for Vicky to figure out what Chantel's problem was. One day, Vicky met an old friend who told her about it. Even before Vicky and I got married, Chantel told her that she was in love with me and she intended to keep me away from Victoria. Well, that never happened. I do remember that Chantel was a little in love with me, but as I said, I always thought she was dirty, so I stayed away. Vicky and I intend to grow old together. And these days, we talk a lot more about our feelings. Oh, I'm a regular at Ricky's club almost every week now. But the Ice Maiden dances a lot more than I do. As for Chantel, neither Victoria nor I have seen her since. It was the night of our next anniversary. I arrived after one of the trips. Vicky attacked me when I walked in the front door. Then she started dragging me into the bedroom, taking off her clothes as she went. Oh, by the way, I tried Chantel just before I married Vicky. Come on, there are advantages to being an identical twin, but really Chantel was just a show. Not a big action. I think she must have been a little mad at Phil when I told her she wasn't that good in bed. Well, I never liked her. 
I'm just wondering if Chantel ever realized that Phil and I had switched for her. If she had, she would have been the only one. Well, I think. But that might explain why she was trying to put the shoe inside. Look, I've already said that I consider myself a gentleman, but I've never said anything about my impeccable character. Whoever dares wins. Life goes on. Just be a little more careful.